Well, thank you so much for joining me wherever you are and whatever time it is for you. It's midnight for me, but I'm feeling very fresh and looking forward to speaking. And I'm speaking to you from the north of England, from Yorkshire, if you know the area. So it's a real pleasure, it's always a pleasure to be invited to join a library. And in this case, a whole group of libraries. When I was young, libraries were my favorite place to go. And I discovered not only that it was a lovely haven, a quiet place to curl up with books, but I discovered worlds of imagination, but it was in a library that I discovered history as a child. And so skip forward many, many years. It's a pleasure for me to be speaking to libraries now and to have my books in libraries. It was libraries that first introduced me to the reality of the Holocaust. And this was as a child. And as a child, just reading books that were designed for children, I could not understand how on earth can this be true? And this is a feeling I keep with me now. The book I'm talking to you about today is The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. And of course, it is a distressing topic. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be discussing some very harrowing scenarios. But I also would like to share with you some elements that are really uplifting. And that is, of all the research I've done, and of all the extremely disturbing and, and upsetting stories that I've encountered and that I've written about, underlying all of them, there is the extraordinary friendship that the dressmakers in Auschwitz nurtured. And this friendship is so powerful, particularly considering, considering the environment they were in, the deprivation, the, degreg the degradation. And the friendship of the dressmakers in Auschwitz continued long after they'd been liberated, long after they'd returned to, to find their homes, if possible, and long after the survivors had dispersed around the world. So I hope you will bear that in mind, that this isn't just going to be, you know, it's not a, just a catalogue of horrors. But I also wanted to tell you that I am having a very interesting week. As it happens, I'm currently installing an exhibition. This exhibition is in a museum in Yorkshire in a fashion gallery, and it's featuring highlights from my collection. I collect vintage and antique garments. And the themes of this exhibition are clothes hold memories and clothes tell stories. I'm a clothes historian, that is my speciality. And for the last 25 years, I've been gathering the stories that clothes tell and trying to explore their memories. So when I first heard mention of a fashion salon in Auschwitz, of course I wanted to know more, which at first it was impossible to find anything out. How could there be a fashion salon, something so lovely, so glamorous, you know, just thinking of beautiful clothes and, and gorgeous fabrics and the skill and so on. How could there be a fashion salon in one of the most horrific places on the planet, a place designed to abuse, to suffer, to murder? And so for many years, you know, I struggled to find out more about about this fashion salon and through serendipity, through books as well, through books, through a series of small miracles, I was able to be in touch with the families of the women who'd worked at this fashion salon in Auschwitz. And their stories had been obscured or they weren't known at all. And it was, it was an immense privilege really to be able to gather their stories through video testimonies, through interviews, through memoirs, through photographs, and to be able to uncover what on earth was this extraordinary place, this anomaly. And one of the, the most precious experiences while researching and writing this book was to interview the last surviving dressmaker 
from the fashion salon in Auschwitz. And if you can see behind me, I've got a collage of portraits and these shows some of the women that I've written about. There were, uh, at its heyday in this fashion salon, there were about 25 prisoners sewing for the Nazi elite. Not only for SS women in the camp itself, that includes the commandant's wife, the wives of other high-ranking officers, it includes some of the guards, but it also includes elite Nazi women in Berlin. There was a big black order book in this fashion salon, and it was said that the very highest names in Berlin put in orders for beautiful garments from this fashion salon. And there was such a waiting list, there was such demand for the skills of these prisoners working in the, in the fashion salon, that there was a six month waiting list for the Berlin clients. So even these, you know, these Berlin women, we can only speculate who they were because like so many documents, the order book itself was lost or destroyed when the camp was evacuated. But you know, you have to wonder, was it Magda Goebbels? Was it Emma Goering? Was it Ava Brown? We don't know. But through all of this, like I said, there was a core of about 25 women. And at, I think at, so far I've, I've tracked down 40 names of women and girls who passed through this, this salon. And what's remarkable, it, the, this salon wasn't just, it wasn't just creating clothes. That was almost, that was a byproduct. This salon became a haven. It became a place where Jewish women could live. For how long they didn't know, but it was a haven and it was also a hub of resistance. And that was something quite extraordinary to me. And so when I went to interview the last surviving seamstress, she lived in California, I flew out to San Francisco. I had a lot of questions, of course, because as a historian, it's one thing to delve into the archives. It's one thing to see, see testimonies, to read memoirs, but speaking to someone, it's a very, very precious resource. And of course, increasingly rare now for Holocaust survivors. So looking behind me, you can see a range of photographs and I'll draw your attention to this image here. This is Bracha, Bracha Kohut, and her sister Katka. This portrait of the two sisters was taken not long before their deportation to Auschwitz in spring 1942. In fact, they were amongst the first official Jewish prisoners to be deported to Auschwitz on the Eichmann transports, and they were amongst the first ever women prisoners in Auschwitz too very young women. All of the women you're seeing here are very young. In fact, the oldest woman that I'll be telling you about, and she was considered old, was a staggering 34 years old, which doesn't seem old to me now. So here is Bracha and Katka, and Bracha is the woman I went to interview. She was 98 years old at the time, very neatly dressed, very neat house full of books, and it was actually, it was possible even speaking to this older woman, it was possible to get a glimpse of how she'd been as a younger woman. And certainly when Bracha was deported, she was very young. She was, I think, 21, 21 years old. And the, her experiences there, I mean, she said to me, she said, I was 1000 days in Auschwitz and I could have died each day a thousand times. So in many ways, her experience, of course, it aged her, but she kept her spirit of optimism throughout. And at 98, she was as bright, as intelligent, uh, as clued up as ever. Her optimism was tainted, understandably, but her optimism helped save her sister's life. And here is Bracha's best friend, Irene. It saved Irene's life and another friend here, Rene. And all of the young women you see here, they all come from Slovakia. It was young Slovakian women who were on these first transports of Jewish prisoners into Auschwitz. There were single women aged between 16 to 40, and they were told they were going to a work camp. So Bracha said they dressed accordingly. You know, I was interested as a clothes historian, 
What do you wear going to a work camp? They wore their best clothes. They wanted to look smart, presentable. They thought they would be treated better. They wore very warm clothes because it was March, April time. It was freezing cold. And they also took with them in the one suitcase they were allowed, they took mementos from home. They thought it would only be a few weeks, but they took some, you know, things, personal things. And the clothes they took, they might have been fashions that they'd bought in, in their hometown. But the chances are they would be homemade too. Because a very traditional skill for women at this time was dressmaking. And certainly, if not dressmaking, but home sewing and home mending. And in writing this book, yes, I wanted to try and understand more about Nazi perpetrators, but I really wanted to put a spotlight on skills that are often overlooked. Sewing. I mean, maybe in your family you have someone who, who can sew on buttons and, and put patches on clothes and darn them. I know it's a bit of a dying art, but also, we have in our families, we know dressmakers and tailors and milliners and so on. And it seems extraordinary to me that sewing could be a skill that would save your life. And it was only by chance that Bracha and Irene and Rani were able to sew. The fascist government in Slovakia banned Jews from running businesses um, and they forced them out of employment and they forced them out of education. And when this happened, they were all very bewildered. What are we going to do? We had these jobs, we had these businesses. And it was Irene out of the group of friends. She said, on the spur of the moment, I decided to learn to sew a little. So Irene persuaded her other friends to learn to sew too. This was all done in secret because the government wouldn't allow them to, to go to a proper apprenticeship to a direct dressmaking school. And so when these young women arrived in Auschwitz, the doors of their cattle cars opened. There they were, very smartly dressed. And Bracha helped her sister down from the cattle wagon. Her sister had a weak heart. And then Bracha was worried because her suitcase was still on the train. And she told me that she was still very naive at this time. And she asked an SS man who was standing there at the ramp. She said, well, I can't, I can't reach my suitcase. I need to get it down you know, as if this was a perfectly ordinary exchange. And the SS man replied, don't worry, we'll take care of your luggage. And oh my goodness, they did. While writing this book, I've really flagged up a lot. One of the strongest underlying motives of Nazi expansion and perpetrator motives, it's greed, plunder. Yes, racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism, very much so. But underlying it all was this rapaciousness, this greed for theft. Everything that new arrivals brought to Auschwitz was stolen from them. The luggage, everything in it, whatever they brought, the Nazis took it, plundered it, sold the gold, kept the clothes. And this plunder was at the highest level. The commandant house at Auschwitz, the commandant was Rudolf Huss. It was filled with stolen furniture. In fact, the house was stolen. It had stolen artwork, stolen tapestries, and the wardrobes were filled with stolen clothes, clothes stolen from prisoners. So Bracha never got to see her suitcase again. And worse than that, these new arrivals in Auschwitz were stripped of everything. And as I close this story, and that really hit home for me, because you might overlook clothes and think, oh, it's just clothes, what do they matter? But of course we all wear them. Clothes give us dignity, perhaps modesty. Clothes show our status. They can reflect our gender. They can show our profession. They can show so much. But to be stripped of your clothes and in public and very brutally, what a deliberately terrifying and degrading experience. And it was deliberate. The Nazis knew very well the power of clothes. They used imagery of clothing to set out the idea that they were the master race. And I'll show you an example here from, this is a National Socialist magazine, if you can see. 
called Frauenwarte. It's a woman's magazine. And the image on the front shows the iconic Nazi male, monolithic, absolutely emotionless and utterly military. So that was the image for men in the Third Reich, absolutely militarized. And for women, but plenty of, of women's magazines from this era, here's fashion magazine, Du Mode, from 1942. Stylish, chic, and fairly respectable as well. So the Nazis knew all about clothes for imagery. They knew about pageantry and theatre in their big rallies. They knew how to wear uniforms and how to use clothes to project an image. But they also understood how clothing can be used to degrade. And so while the SS in concentration camps had their smart woolen uniforms, very clean, very warm in winter, the prisoners were deliberately stripped to humiliate them. And then put in, in the case of these young women, they were put into old uniforms worn by murdered Russian POWs. And later arrivals were put in the infamous striped clothes of Auschwitz. And it was to set them aside as not part of this master race. They were considered subhuman. So their clothing was supposed to reflect that. But I can tell you, that many prisoners still, even in these worst of circumstances, if they could possibly get hold of a needle and thread, which were forbidden to prisoners, they used needle and thread, sometimes threads unraveled from the edge of their clothes to try and smarten their appearance, to give themselves a feeling of dignity again, and perhaps hope they would be better treated if they looked a little more respectable. So these young women arriving in Auschwitz in spring 1942, they were first put to hard labor and some quite horrific, well, very horrific. Why am I, why am I glossing over it? The mortality rate was 80%. And this was even before the gas chambers were opened. In fact, they had to help build the gas chambers with their bare hands, demolishing buildings and so on. And they knew it was very unlikely they could survive. So inevitably, they looked for easier jobs, perhaps jobs that could be indoors. There were jobs sorting through the plunder that arrived daily in Auschwitz, opening suitcases and rifling through the clothes, sorting them into bundles to be sent back to Germany or to the commandant's house. And Bracher, who I went to interview, she was so resilient, she was so optimistic, she found herself a place in one of these plunder warehouses. She got her sister a place there too and her friend Irene. Now to give you a sense of why I keep focusing on clothes in this history, I'd like to show you two garments during this presentation today. They're both uh, original garments from my collection and hopefully it will give you a sense of how clothes can hold memories and how they can give us a lot of clues about eras in the past. So the first one I'll show you, here we are. It's a very pretty dress. So if you can see, I hope the light catches the lovely shade of apple green here. It's a spring dress. So lovely spring green floral dress made of crepe fabric, silk crepe. And the dress dates to about 1939, very significant year in history. And it's a German dress. And looking at this dress, we can see that it's quite a skimpy cut. It's got a very narrow hem, very narrow seams. It's not flamboyant. And this definitely reflects the German economy in the late 1930s. Hitler, the National Socialists are gearing everything towards remilitarization. They're ready for war. They've already been expanding in Europe. They mean to take over everything. And so civilian items, they're much harder to come by. Fabric is scarce, labor is scarce. And so that's why we have quite skimpy styles and it's reflected even in paper. So I can show you from one of the fashion magazines. When you have dressmaking magazines, you, if you know anything about dressmaking, you often get patterns that are many sheets of tissue paper with the outline of the pattern pieces on them. But because of war shortages in Germany, you would get one sheet of paper. 
And this one sheet of paper for dressmaking could have pattern pieces for up to 20 different garments. So just have a look at the overlay there. And so you can make a variety of outfits, but all of the outfits, all of the pattern pieces on one sheet of paper. So we're already getting a sense of the German economy and scarcity for civilians. But the Nazis themselves, particularly the higher ups, they were not troubled by scarcity because plunder was at the core of everything. In fact, Hermann Goering, I think it was 1937, he said, I intend to plunder and to do it thoroughly. But he wasn't the only one. Plunder was at the core of everything. And this dress is part of that history. And this dress looks very pretty, but it's actually saturated with anti-Semitism. Just to give you a little bit of context here while I'm talking about Germany, because I've been talking about young women from Slovakia. This photo here, if you can see, move my chair. This is the, the, the old woman, the woman who's 34, right, old. Her name is Hunja. Hunja uh, Stork, she was, she was born, but she became Hunja Volkman. She married in the 1930s. And Hunja wasn't an accidental dressmaker. She wasn't one of these young women who said, oh, what are we going to do? Let's learn to sew. Hunja loved sewing from childhood. She underwent a seven year apprenticeship. She was extremely talented. And growing up in a small town in Slovakia, she decided that no, she wanted to go to a big city. Not Bratislava, not even Prague, which was a great fashion center. She headed west into Germany and she opened a fashion salon in the city of Leipzig. And Hunja dressed the elite of Leipzig, Jews and non-Jews. She was Jewish, these are, these are all Jewish women. And she did really well. She could flip through a fashion magazine and you could point out a design that you like and she could draw it. She didn't need a pattern. She could draw the pattern pieces on newspaper. That was it, cut them out. My grandmother was a dressmaker too, and that's how she worked. She could just see it, very clever. So Hunya was a really skilled designer as well as a maker and very popular in Leipzig, and she loved Leipzig. But she was in Germany in the 1930s, and she saw the, the rise of National Socialism, but she also saw Hitler come to power. And she saw how this began to affect everyday Jewish life the bullying, the restrictions, the humiliations, and the theft. So what she didn't know was in 1933, just a few weeks after Hitler came to power, a group of businessmen met in a beer cellar in Berlin, and they established a federation of businesses called ADEFA. ADEFA is an acronym, and I can show you the ADEFA logo, or one of them. So this is a tie, by the way, a man's tie from Germany in the 1930s, just a plain tie, wool tie. But if we peek inside, it holds secrets. Clothes hold stories. So can you see the ADEFA printed inside? Little, little, uh, little worn now after all these years, ADEFA. ADEFA is the German acronym, but in English it stands for German Aryan Federation of Textile and Clothing Manufacturers. German Aryan. Aryan is a made up racist concept. It means not Jewish. So essentially these businessmen were meeting to set up a federation to say, let's have a federation of garment and textile manufacturers with no Jews. Of course, this suited Nazi ideology perfectly. They had full support of the Nazi government. And the idea was to make the fashion trade Jew free. And the fashion trade wasn't just catwalks, you know, it wasn't just glamorous fashions to compete with Paris or New York or London. The fashion trade encompasses textile mills and manufacturers, department stores and boutiques, the whole lot. They said, we're going to make it Jew free. 
but the fashion trade was absolutely enriched with Jewish capital and Jewish talent. Adefa didn't care about that. At whatever the cost, they wanted Jewish businesses. And so they stole department stores and factories and boutiques and little milliners and the local tailors. And with the help of Nazi laws, which essentially ousted Jews from their own businesses, Adefa was able to take over. And so this dress, this pretty green dress, bears the Adefa label. And there it is. So even a pretty little dress like this can hold a really dark history. So Hunya, our very talented dressmaker in Leipzig, she was aware of all of this. She was aware of the Nazi brown shirts, encouraging people to boycott Jewish shops. She was aware of increasing violence on the streets, of people going missing, being rounded up. She lived through the violence of the November pogroms called Kristallnacht, and she had to close the salon. In fact, the Nazis and organizations like Adefa were so successful that not only did they render the fashion trade Jew free, they aimed to render the whole of Germany Jew free. In fact, the whole of the Third Reich Jew free. And we now know exactly what was meant by Jew free. It wasn't just emigration. It wasn't just people leaving. They meant extinction, eradication. But it took steps. And along the way, along every single step towards the final solution was greed. Appropriating businesses, stealing Jewish belongings when they're deported, and using Jewish labor, because with Jewish people ousted from work, the Germans found they had a staff shortage. Who was going to make all those products without the Jewish labor? And so in the textile workshops, in the factories, in, uh, in, in Honia's case, actually, she was put to work in the fur trade in Leipzig as a forced laborer. So now they didn't even need to pay the workers wages they could have free labor in return for soup and the right to life. And these workshops, there were thousands of them in ghettos, uh, in, in town, normal towns, in, in factories, but also in the concentration camps. A huge part of the concentration camps was about money. It was about profit for the SS and that's how Auschwitz started out. And so when these young women arrived in Auschwitz and, and Hunya came a little later, she was on the last train of Jews deported from Leipzig in 1943. And uh, actually when, I, I'm smiling because I mean, Hunya is a remarkable person. I really, really enjoyed speaking with her relatives to learn more about her. And they had so many stories. When Hunya arrived at Auschwitz after a very harrowing journey in which she kept everyone's spirits up, she was traveling with her friend Ruth and Ruth's husband. And as the doors opened, you know, think of the lights and the dogs and the shouting, Ruth's husband turned to Ruth and said, stick with Hunya, I have a feeling she'll make it. And he was right. I mean, of course, luck luck played its part and of all respondents I've seen who were asked you know who survived you know why did you survive how could you survive they said luck luck first and foremost and then friendship because the whole aim of this arrival as a deportee to Auschwitz to confuse you to shock you to humiliate you was to make you forget that you were a decent human being. It was so that you would feel ground down and subhuman as the Nazis wanted. But Hunya managed to retain her dignity and her humanity despite the humiliations. And she stood up to SS guards. It, I mean, it's extraordinary really. And she inspired other people you know, to have, have that resilience. So Hunya arrived in 1943 and like most other deportees, she suffered hunger, disease, and horrific working conditions until one day she was called for an audition. She had no idea what was going on. 
she was put in front of a sewing machine and told to sew. So she did. Now she was a brilliant seamstress. This is, this is great. No problem passing the test. And she did pass and miraculously, she was led out of Birkenau, the, the subcamp, the extension of Auschwitz. And she was marched to a beautiful white building just near the main gate in the Auschwitz main camp. And she was pushed into this building and it was, she said it was like heaven, it was clean. There were no lice, no filth, no feces on the floor. People were wearing clean clothes, prisoners. And some of them even had hair that was allowed to grow and they could wash. And she was there in filth, in rags, emaciated, desperate. She couldn't believe it. And then suddenly she was surrounded by friendly faces, friendly voices. These were friends from Slovakia, also prisoners. And they were in this building, they'd been selected to do special indoor work for the SS. They'd heard that Hunya was in Birkenau and they did their best to get her out. And she'd been selected to work in a fashion salon. She'd never heard of such a thing. How could you be, have a fashion salon in a death camp? So I need to perhaps backtrack a little and explain how on earth this fashion salon came to be. So I've talked about plunder. I've talked about Nazi greed. I've talked about the commandant's house and how it was filled with stolen belongings. And the commandant's wife, Hedwig Huss, was an absolute pro at theft. She took food and clothes and furniture anything she wanted. And she also exploited prisoner labor from Auschwitz. She had prisoners create a beautiful garden at the house, the commandant's house, which is next to the camp. It's just across the wall and a garden filled with flowers and bees and picnic tables and a swimming pool and her children played here. And so she used prisoner labor for anything and she needed prisoners to make clothes for her. And one of the prisoners she selected to sew for her personally was a woman here, another young woman who had been deported from Slovakia and her name is Marta. And Marta is the main reason that all of these young women survived. All of the women who passed through the fashion salon, those lucky enough to survive, it's thanks to Marta. Marta was 25 years old when she came to Auschwitz, quite a quiet woman. And she was a brilliant dressmaker, brilliant. She had her own salon. She was specialized in cutting. So she was able to convert paper patterns into wonderful 3D garments. And Marta had come to the attention of the commandant's wife that she could sew. And she was put in the attic of the commandant's house. And here you could see out over the camp, it was so close. And here she sewed. And this was a very cushy job. This was nice, it was indoors. You could sometimes, the, the prisoners working in the commandant's kitchen would be able to smuggle her food, which was, you know, a lifesaver. But more importantly than that, Marta was a very courageous and very compassionate young woman. Although Auschwitz was designed to humiliate her and make her forget her humanity, she never did. She used her position to save lives. She said to the commandant's wife, oh, there's too much sewing for me. I'm going to need someone else to help. And her friend Berta came to help. And then Berta said, oh, we need a girl in the workshop, you know, in this room to pick up pins and just do little jobs. We'll get my, uh, my little Rojika in who was 14. And so there was another life. And then Marta said, oh, you know, Frau Huss, I know someone who's a really good hairdresser. I know someone who's a good knitter. They could, she could knit baby clothes for you. And with this, Marta helped lift people out of the hell of Auschwitz-Birkenau into relative safety and it's all relative because one mistake you could be out you could be in the gas chambers 
Now, eventually, the other SS wives got so jealous of the work that Marta was doing for the commandant's wife, they said, well, we want beautiful clothes too. And so Hedvig Huss, the commandant's wife, established a fashion salon in Auschwitz, just outside the main camp. And this is the fashion salon that I've been researching and talking to you about. And once in the salon, Marta made it her mission to rescue as many people as possible. And so she was able to draw Irene into the salon. And Irene said, well, I can't really sew very well. Marta said, we'll teach you. And Irene said, oh, my friend Bracha, she could work for you. Next in is Bracha. Bracha said, oh, my sister Katka, she's a really good tailor. She could work. And, and so the salon grew. Now, I don't want you to think that, you know, this was all easy. Of course it wasn't. They were sewing for the SS. Their clients were wives of mass murderers. The very men who were destroying thousands of lives daily. And outside the walls of the salon, it was hell. Within the salon it was clean and beautiful, gorgeous fabrics. The clients flicked through fashion magazines, chose their designs, and they had, I think what's so important, they had each other. These young women, and most of them were from Slovakia, you know, they were friends and relatives and so on. They could talk about home, they could share memories. They, I mean, they set up classes. Those who were religious were able to follow their religious observances and they could remind themselves that they were human and they could do meaningful work. And when I went to interview Bracha, I asked her, I said, you know, you were sewing for the SS. What was that like to be crafting beautiful garments for these hideous perpetrators? And I said, you know, what was it like? What was Hedwig Huss like? And Bracha completely surprised me. She thought about it for a bit. What was Hedwig Huss, the commandant's wife, like? She said, well, she had four children. Her figure wasn't so good. You know, she just thought of it in terms of dressmaking. That wasn't the whole story. Of course, Bracha carried anger. She carried anger that her family had been murdered. She carried anger at the horrific brutality that she endured, that her friends endured, and everything that she'd seen. But it was just that thought of Bracca saying, analyzing the commandant's wife, her figure, for how to dress her. And Bracca told me one anecdote that I, I can share now. There are many, many more in the book. She said one time one of the dressmakers was, was ironing a dress for a client and the client the that usually it was the the ss men came on saturdays to collect the garments each dressmaker was supposed to make two garments a week and they were they weren't just you know everyday clothes they, they did children's clothes and you know clothes for picnics and so on but hunya said she said they also made evening gowns for the ss to go off to elegant functions she said they were gowns these women could not have imagined in their wildest dreams. So staggeringly beautiful things. Anyway, the client was coming to collect the dress or to, no, to be fitted for the dress and a dressmaker was ironing it. And you can see where this is going. She scorched the dress right on the front. And you or I might hate to do that. You know, what a, what a terrible thing. You've ruined a dress. But they're in a fashion salon in Auschwitz. They are Jewish prisoners sewing for the SS. It's terrifying. They know that this could mean their death. But it was Marta, amazing Marta, who salvaged this situation. And I cannot emphasize enough what a remarkable person Marta was. If you read the book, there's a whole chapter on her work with the Auschwitz resistance, with the underground, and information about her escape. She really is uh, one of those quiet heroines that deserve to be far better known. Well, I guess she is quite well known now as people read the book. But Marta saved the situation of the burnt dress. She said, don't worry, we'll get a patch of fabric here, we'll alter it here, we'll change the design here, nobody will know. So the next day, the SS woman arrives to have the dress fitted and she's looking in the mirror. There's a fitting room in the workshop. She's looking in the mirror and Marta's standing there with her tape measure, you know, waiting. The client says, 
don't know about this. She said, it seems a little different from, from the design. And Marta said, no, 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 this is the dress. This is the latest fashion. And the client was very happy and went away with her dress. And no lives were lost that day. So there is, there is so much more. I could tell you about uh, the young women, that their time in the salon, and then of course, the evacuation of Auschwitz in January, 1945. They endured the death march and not all of them survived. They endured further labor camps and concentration camps and they endured liberation. And Hunya wrote quite some quite extraordinary scenes about liberation in her memoir, um, Really, Hunya took on the Russian army pretty much. She was extraordinary. But then they had the sadness of returning home, those who'd survived and trying to rebuild lives and trying to trace lost family and coming to the realization of the staggering horror that we now call the Holocaust. So much destruction and loss and, and death and it, all completely unnecessary. Greed and anti-Semitism. And one of the first things that the survivors did when they got home or when they got to a DP camp was to try and get hold of a sewing machine, to continue with the skills that had saved their lives, to continue sewing and making, not only to earn a living, but also if they got married and started a family. And one of the most poignant objects I saw while I was researching and writing this book was uh, Irene's sewing work box that her family still had and it was still full of all her silk threads and needles and so on. So I interviewed Bracha, the last surviving seamstress of the fashion salon Auschwitz. I, I combed the archives and so on and I wrote the book and I had no idea that it would have such a reception. Clearly there is something about it that's resonated with people. This, this aspect of history that's not been known before, but also a story of female friendship, of female heroism and sewing skills. So the book was on the New York Times bestseller list for six months, which is, is extraordinary to me. And it's been very popular in libraries. So thank you libraries for helping promote it. And it's been translated now into 22 different languages. So you can read it in Polish, you can read it in Slovakian. Do you know there's an edition out in Russia, an edition coming out in Ukraine, even in Ukraine, isn't that extraordinary? And in Israel, in Hebrew. And I, I, I'm gonna finish now, much as I would love to tell you more, you can of course read the book if you'd like to know the full history of the dressmakers of Auschwitz, but I'll leave you with um, words from them. And I shall leave you with two quotes, one from Hunya, the invincible Hunya. Hunya was chatting with her niece Gila in Tel Aviv in Israel. And she told Gila, she said, don't become a seamstress. She said, true, it saved my life, but you just sit there and sew. And so Gila was quite taken aback by this. Um, she did not become a seamstress. But as Hunya was sitting and sewing in Tel Aviv after the war, she was telling Gila stories of her life in Slovakia before the war and of her experiences in Auschwitz and in Marta's workshop. And Hunya sewed for clients in Tel Aviv, just as she had done in Slovakia and in Leipzig and in Auschwitz, but she also sewed out of love. So I promised you two garments. Here's the second garment. This is a very smart, silky two-piece suit stitched in the 1950s, so in post-war Israel. And it was made out of one of Hunya's dresses. Hunya, being very thrifty, turned one of her dresses into a smart suit for her niece, Gila. Gila needed a new suit. And Gila donated Hunya's suit to, to my collection, and it is the most precious thing I own. And when I look at this, I, I think of Hunya's dressmaking skills, I think of her resilience, I think of her extraordinary sense of humor. And there's no label in it to say who made it. There's no label to say what her experiences were. 
but I look at the stitches in here and I think this woman survived the Holocaust through sewing and through luck and friendship. So really garments can have extraordinary memories and stories, can't they? So there's the suit Hunya made, but I promised you two quotes. There's one from Hunya saying, don't sew. But my final quote will be from Marta, the, the very courageous Marta who helped save so many lives. And Marta after the war said, sewing saved my life. Why would I do anything else?